Hello and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 476. That's 476 of the Agassino Zynga show. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube. You know what to do. Smash that like and subscribe. And of course, leave me a comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts, feelings, suggestions. And of course, if you're listening to us via the podcasting app, say five star review and a little cheeky share will help the show spread out there, get viral and go up on those bloody charts that I don't pay attention to. I promise. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome too to get bonus content on patreon.com for just Agostino. You can get the details on the show descriptions click on there on that link subscribe for it is one pound you get access to the exact all the bonus content that i've got on there so make sure you jump on there and get involved don't delay do that to a day whoops whoopity whoopity do how am i doing whoopity whoopity do doing pretty well um gym sessions have been going on pretty steadily at the moment probably my most consistent week out of the last few even though i try to go a minimum of like four to five times a week you know still and sometimes you end up doing three or you end up doing four and a bit and the fourth workout isn't the best but i'm slowly but surely getting to a much better place in terms of recovery i think that's always a really good indicator or marker to tell where you're at in terms of you know your ability to work out in the continuous amounts of days is usually your off day is a good example of where you're at fitness wise i feel like if you're able to recover on your off day and then go back in the next day pretty well then you're on your way but if you need a couple of days or if you're super sore every single day so you know especially if you're not really pushing the weight limits and you're just doing stuff that you've been doing on a monday even towards the end of the week that's definitely is an indicator of kind of the work you need to do um, more so than the actual workout so because when you do it you know i think sometimes adrenaline and just being around other people that are pushing themselves you can sometimes grind out a pretty heavy workout or a pretty hard one pretty easily but then on the off day when you're at home and you're kind of relaxing and your muscles are somewhat repairing themselves that's when you really get to see where you're at so so far so good one day's off is usually the most i need and then i go back into it again so this is my kind of off day today and then back again tomorrow i'm going to do actually a double session tomorrow I'll try and do double sessions on monday and double sessions on fridays just to kind of cap the week or start the week really strong and obviously end it really strong and i'm hoping now especially with the clubs reopening i'm gonna have the same sort of um habits and uh timetable and stuff that i do in terms of working out to hopefully balance out all the little debauchery activities that i get into because if there's one thing that i can't be doing is what i was doing probably in the past where i was kind of pushing myself on one end and not kind of keeping up with the health stuff and then in- eventually you get to a point where you end up crashing so If there's one thing that we've kind of learned or you've hoped you've kind of learned over this sort of prolonged period of time being indoors, you've probably been able to somehow realize or come to some sort of form of clarity as to the things that you enjoy doing, the things that bring a a smile on your face, the things that bring you joy. And if they don't involve, you know, getting smashed and getting high all the time, then you should try your best to make sure that you can enjoy them with a somewhat clear, sober mind. What happened for? I don't know what happened there. Is it working now? For some reason, it went off out of nowhere. Is it working now? It should be. Let's double check and make sure everything's fine. Okay, everything's fine. But yeah, when you cap off your week, when you start your week off really strong and you end it really strong, it definitely it helps to make you, it definitely helps to push you in the right way. Push in the right way? No. It definitely gives you the opportunity to make the right decisions, right? Usually, I feel like. Um, it's sort of like equivalent to maybe doing one cheat day instead of two. Usually, if you pick one you make better decisions than you do if you pick two and it kind of you know overlaps into the next day um so yeah that's hopefully what i'm gonna do going forward so it's been pretty decent not gonna lie um i'm happy to hear now um the news got confirmed recently i got a little email mailer from my local legislator basically confirming that going forward they're still going to going forward they're still going to keep the whole like timed entry thing because a few of the most of the gyms in the uk obviously due to covid restrictions they implemented a new thing where you had to basically book a time slot in order to go and most of the time if you're in a you know most gyms prior to covid you just have two types of memberships one would be a peak one would be off peak and whatever one you have would then permit you to go into the gym 
across those hours that you're permitted to use them but now obviously with covid and with all those restrictions they put into place timed entry so they would limit the amount of people in there so give them time to clean all that good sort of good stuff so um even with the world reopening i think they've realized that it's a far better way to keep the gym in a sort of clean and orderly manner and it lessens the overall traffic inside because the last thing you want is to be you know having to jump and skip and move around people or lifting heavy stuff it's just not the best place to be if you want to be free with your weights and move around and whatever it may be so it's glad i'm glad to hear they're keeping the sort of like staggered releases um figure at the moment it's about capped about 13 to 15 people per like 10 minute increments um which is definitely handy the times i go in the morning or sometimes late in the afternoon it's pretty much okay because there's hardly anyone there but it's definitely a good thing to see going forward so that's been a good revelation all things considered um but yeah many things to jump on into many things to discuss many things to explore so if it's your first time last time whatever it may be grab yourself a little drink a little munchie and we're gonna dive on a deep so first things first um united have released um, images of the up and coming kit for this season obviously naturally um every season there's a new kit every season there's a new design kids are having to rush out to buy and every season we are generally disappointed with the performance of united in the league or in general in terms of you know not being able to win trophies and having to somehow you know legislate that despite us not winning a trophy somehow this never the manager's fault but regardless we move the kit itself has been met with some level of derision between the united fans base i think a lot of people don't really like it personally myself i don't normally buy united kits anyway in general um because of the whole glazer stuff i try to make it possible that i'm not putting any money in those guys pockets but you know again you know it's a global force a global brand um i'm pretty much sure my little strike that i'm doing preventing me or where i'm not buying any sort of club merch isn't necessarily making driving home any points especially when the fan base is so divided as it is so i was thinking to myself oh i do need to add a kit to my arsenal of jerseys because most of mine i had prior i've already given them away i'm not exactly the kind of person like walking around with a football football jersey on unless i'm actually playing football i'm not one of these kind of four kit wankers you know it's not, it's not something i do but when i did see these images leaked of this new united kit i did quite like it because of why people hate it it sort of looks like a pro sports type of jersey right sort of like something that you would make on a blank you know back in the day there were these companies that did blank football jerseys that you could you know um put your sunday league badge on into whatever it may be and they'd have these kind of really basic designs like canvases that you'd use and then every team basically had the same you know let's say three to five designs but just different color combinations and then obviously with your emblem and whatever it may be and maybe the numbers are different but in terms of the design of the shirt it was all the same and it sort of looks similar to that so it's obviously vintage inspired but i like the plain nature of it um obviously the white collar here is a bit of a problem when you're playing football you're going to be sweating a lot you're probably going to be using this collar to wipe some of the sweat on your chin or your face so this is going to get really yucky and brown and whatnot very very quickly but you know you'd hope that you're mostly going to wear them maybe when you're only doing you know when you're watching the game so you're not gonna be sweating too tough but i'd think for me personally i'd like to wear it you know again playing you know your five-a-side game here and there um again i quite like that so the design overall apart from the contrasting white color even though you could probably make it red to make it tonal but it probably wouldn't look as nice as it does so it's probably a little stylistic choice there and then you've got the top of course worn itself in long sleeve in my opinion looks really cool i know some people don't like it because it just it does look a little bit plain and a little bit basic but i like it in that respect because it doesn't look too much like a football jersey there's nothing worse like i said than wearing a football top and not playing football especially if you're watching it on a live stream or something and you're screaming and shouting your computer you just look like an absolute weapon in my own opinion but with this you sort of get the balance you get a kind of your training kit you know sort of vibe and you also let people know that you're obviously supporting the team that you're actually wearing at that particular time unless of course you're brendan Shaw and you own every jersey of every team <laughs> that ever existed because of some weird weak connection you have with them but yeah i quite like it man you know the white cuffs are quite nice again the white thing the white shorts like it's i wouldn't wear the shorts or the socks or anything but the shirt on, on its own i quite like it i think it looks really really good so that might be the first jersey i end up copying um in a few years i think the previous one might have been 
one of our ones from like 2014 15 season or something i forgot when po- rodrigo possible was at the club that's probably the last jersey i owned and i've actually got i actually had one with rio ferdinand's number on it that i had signed but i ended up giving that away as well um but yeah pretty decent jersey i'll definitely end up purchasing that i'm actually a fan of it i, I think you know maybe one of the only united fans that would wear the new jersey especially when you'd see what happens on social media in terms of the reception that's definitely received so i'm looking forward to getting that next news on the football circuit we've got um announcement or some info regarding rafael Varane, the center back from real madrid that's been heavily linked with united obviously um you know being a united fan you would know or being a fan myself of United, most people would be aware that we're crying out for a commanding centre back to play alongside Harry Maguire. Even though Harry Maguire was signed as a commanding centre back, but we move, we move, we move, we move. But of course, over the period of last season, we both we basically got to understand that maybe Harry Maguire isn't the kind of defender that we all thought he would be and he does maybe he's not as transformational as like a Virgil van Dijk was for Liverpool who basically came in and was able to kind of lift the game of every other defender that was already there um, in a different sort of way but Harry Maguire doesn't necessarily have the pace or the organizational skills to do so so you need somebody to complement him and usually the best partnerships especially defensive partnerships are usually people that can kind of make up for the other person's deficiencies right if one person's really strong in the air the other person's really good in the feet if one person is really slow, the other person is really fast, one person is really reactive, the one person is very um, patient, right, and can kind of t- t- uh, kind of nick the ball off somebody, like I'd imagine, like a Jared Pique is a good example, he needs somebody next to him that's probably a little bit more tenacious, a little bit more aggressive in the tackle, whereas he can be a little bit more, you know, um, a little bit more cute and flick the ball off you and play the ball out from the back, it's good to have somebody like a commanding centre back, like a, you know, like a Puyo, how was he was back in the day, he was like all action, in a sort of like a John Terry-esque way, those are really good partnerships, so we've basically seen that that works, but obviously the issue, only problem I have with this rumour is that throughout last season, even though Eric Bailly gets injured a lot, there was a period where he wasn't injured, but still it seemed as if Ole Gunnar Solskjaer preferred playing Victor Lindelof, who clearly isn't the best partner for Harry Maguire. I'm still a fan of Victor Lindelof. I think I'm one of the only ones that still thinks there's a decent defender in him. I think you play him, if he was to ever sign for a club like Barcelona, for instance, or somebody else that plays from out the back with three defenders, I think he'd look fairly decent. I think he looked fairly decent for Sweden in the Euros, for instance, but I just think when he's played in a two, in a back four, his deficiencies come out, and obviously playing in the Premier League where it's very aggressive, the defender's back into you, there's loads of balls there in the air, and you know, one thing that Victor Lindelof of struggles with is dealing with the balls in the air heading the balls not really one of his strengths but throughout the entire of last season even though we knew Harry Maguire had the deficiencies we keep Solskjaer still persisted with playing um, Lindelof over Bay. now that might be just a purely on a confidence and trust thing he might just say I don't trust Bay to stay fit so I'm just going to play Victor Lindelof regardless or it might be the fact that he actually thinks Victor Lindelof is a better defender than Eric Bay, which is concerning or he thinks it's a better fit with Harry Maguire which is concerning so with the Rafael Ref- 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 Varane thing, I think there is no danger that happening because of his profile, right? He's such a top class or well-regarded defender coming from Real Madrid. It's very unlikely that he's going to be playing second fiddle to, second fiddle to Victor Lindelof. He's definitely going to be signed with the hopes that he would play alongside Harry Maguire, right? And so it's a big name. He's a former Gal- He'll be a former Galactico. You know, they can sell it branding. He's won a World Cup, blah, 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 right? I'm sure there's a lot of things that can tie into that or that would back up that point. But the only thing I say in terms of United fans getting giddy over this is that number one, I'm a bit concerned that a Real Madrid player of his caliber, of his at his age, would be up for joining United at the stage at where we're at, at the moment. Swapping Real Madrid, where you're legitimately challenging for the title every season, you're challenging for the Champions League, you're actually in contention of winning domestic cups. Um, you usually got the best managers, the best coaches, the best players playing around you. It just seems like a bit of a drop to come to United. For someone like him, especially at his age, because he's at 28, 29 or something, right? He's just under 30. So you would imagine he hasn't got another big move after him, after this in him, probably. He'll probably still be able to command a good enough wage in the continent. But in terms of winning trophies, this is probably one of his kind of quote unquote last hurrahs. And there's no guarantee with Oligon Solskjaer can charge that we're going to win anything. And even if we are, you would imagine we need to sign a lot of other quality players of his caliber in order to put us in contention, which again, with the owners that we have at the moment, that isn't something that you could take for granted and think it's going to generally 
actually happen. So that's the only thing I'd really be concerned about. And then, of course, in the Euros, Rafa, Rafa, Rafa Varane, fair, fair enough, he was playing alongside, I'm just going to Raphael, Raphael, so I'll keep getting stumbling. Rafa Varane alongside Kimpembe was pretty awful, I thought. I thought Kimpembe, don't get me wrong, he's the kind of defender, he reminds me a little bit of Mikel Silvestre at United back in the day. He kind of inspires, um, he doesn't inspire confidence, right? He makes you panic, like sort of in the Phil Jones kind of quality or thing where he can have his good games, but he can make anybody panic. And maybe Rafa, Rafa Varane, sorry, again, his name was sort of thrown off his kind of game by playing alongside Kim Bembe. But I didn't think he looked that impressive at all playing out um, from defense or even defending one-on-ones. I just didn't think he looked that impressive. And something that I would have seen or that would have made more sense, especially long term, or especially immediate and long term, I would have thought it would have made more sense for United to go for like a Sergio Ramos, who can't get me wrong, he's older, he's only he's 35, he's obviously trying to get a last payday, but somebody that may, could still do a job, I feel like, at this level, and he's got the personality and the kind of aggression needed to really kind of revamp that defence, make it a little bit mean, make it a little bit aggressive, make it a little bit lean, mean, whatever it may be. And then you sign him for a couple of years. And then if you want to sign, like, who's that defender for playing for Lille? Is it Sven Botman or something? One of those, like, up-and-coming defenders that you've got your eye on. You can then have those guys as, like, a long-term plan. But then for the immediate seat, in order to kind of get a trophy in the cabinet and ensure that you have your defenders learning from some of the, one of the best defenders in, you know, in the history of the game, it would have made more sense for us to go for a Sergio Ramos as opposed to, like, a Rafa Varane, I think. Because I just don't trust this coaching team or this coaching setup to kind of bring the best out of him or to utilize him in the best way. And I think having the midfield that you have at Real Madrid playing in front of you as a defender is completely different to coming at United and having to play behind, you know, having McFred playing in front of our defenders and our defenders playing in front of the goalkeeper. It's just that whole combination, that whole core of the team doesn't necessarily reflect the qualities that Rafa Vernovic is used to at Real Madrid. And then, of course, the salary... Is he going to come in and command like, you know, crazy weekly wage, which isn't none of our issue, none of our problem as fans, because, you know, who cares? But in terms of, of upsetting the harmony of the group and just creating unnecessary problems, if he doesn't end up being a good uh, in- investment or signing, having referee and come in and command a wage of like 300,000 a week plus would just completely mess the whole situation up because we've got, you know, players like Martial and stuff on 150. We've got players like um, Bruno Fernandes probably on like 200 or something per week. If he's playing to the level that he played at in the beginning of last season and he replicates it again, he could be in a position where he's like, hold on, I'm contributing way more to this team than this guy is. Why is he on 300 and I'm on 200? And I've been here a year longer. You've seen what I can do. So it's just unnecessary, those kind of signings, because I feel like they just sometimes cause more harm than good. And then also, especially when you've got such a well-oiled proven winner in Sergio Ramos on the table I know he's 35 maybe for 33 it'll be different um you know but still I still think that would have been maybe the better sign to go for a long term now who knows maybe Rafa Ryan comes in and he's a perfect mold perfect partner for him Maguire and all this stuff doesn't matter but it's still concerning and on the other side of things I think for fans of um United and in general people that are just super keen on Oli Gonzalez as a manager and they call them um Oli sexuals on the timeline I just think now, if we do end up signing, we're kind of so far haven't guaranteed. We haven't confirmed Jaden Sancho, but by all accounts, he's got his medical done. He's on holiday at Rashford at the moment, so more likely than not, he's a United player. Then you've got um, Rafa Van being signed, maybe a midfielder, maybe not. Who knows if Pogba stays a defensive midfielder? I'd like to join. That wouldn't matter about Pogba then, because you can then push him up further the pitch. It would mean that, especially if we finish second last year, the general way forward or a general way to gauge our improvement over the season would be either to finish with a higher points tally or to finish higher in the table, right? That would be where you'd say, okay, this is a clear improvement. If we can't have a higher points tally, if we can't finish second and, and win the uh, finish first sorry, and win the league, or dare I say win a European trophy or another domestic trophy, then people have to really start looking at Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and wondering whether or not he's good enough for the job. I personally have never really been the biggest fan of him. I definitely do think he's done a lot of good in terms of um, reviving and restoring the harmony at the club post Mourinho. We've seen how toxic he can be as an influence. Um, you know, his ongoing sort of like verbal war with Luke Shaw that doesn't really make any sense, but hey, 
but so he's a good manager in that, in that sense. But in terms of being the person to take us to the next level in terms of winning trophies, um, potentially winning the league, he's just not the guy. And that's okay. You're allowed to be a person. You're allowed to be a coach that's good enough to take a team to a certain level. And then after that period of time, another top coach comes in and takes them to the next. Similar to what happened with you know Frank Lampard at Chelsea, right? He was saying at the time when he um, signed at Chelsea and they signed all those players that that Chelsea team couldn't be challenging for the league and couldn't do this, couldn't do that. Um, he obviously got fired, I think, when... And Chelsea were out of the top five and then towards the end of the season Thomas Tuchel ends up winning the Champions League with that same Chelsea team and ends up finishing third so it goes to prove that top class managers do make a difference as much as some you know donut fans would like to say managers are overrated their influence overrated don't really matter they do matter like I think the house is a big Stephen Housen from um Trafford Paddock's a big guy that uses one of the bigger guys that says that on these platforms um that managers aren't that important they don't really make much of a difference it's just it's obviously not true we've got demonstrable um evidence to show that especially just anecdotal evidence from just last season alone with thomas tuchel so my line in the sand will be if oligon social can't win a trophy or finish at higher points tally or position in the league which effectively will mean league champions then he has to get sacked he has to um with this level of investment in the team and he's not able to kind of bring home any trophies, any silverware. There is no way, other way forward because I think most people, actual sensible fans, have always said from the very, very beginning that he's the kind of coach that needs signings, right? He can't necessarily coach a team into being champions. He's not going to be able to do what Klopp did at Liverpool, right? Where he's been able to take fairly mediocre players outside of some of his special stars and make them league champions. That's not what Solskjaer can do. He's a good man manager, he's good at cajoling people, obviously positive influence on some of the young guys, but in terms of being that tactical coaching maverick kind of guy, that's just not his game. And that's what we need in the, going forward, yeah, um, to actually win a league, league title, especially when you look at the other top quality managers in the league like Pep, like Klopp, like Thomas Tuchel. It just doesn't seem, for all the sense in the world, I just can't see a scenario where Solskjaer somehow finishes the season ahead of those three guys. It just doesn't make any sense with the CVs that they have, with the experience that they have, with the evidence that we've seen of what they can do. It just doesn't make any sense why he'd finish ahead of them just with players alone. And if it does happen, then that would throw out all the assertions in the world with top teams needing to have top coaches. Because what we'll see, if that's the case, that you don't need top team, top coaches, you don't need top managers when you got a top team. You just need to have really, really good players. Um, and I don't think that's the case. I don't think Bayern Munich could just, you know, hire flipping. AD Bufroid and still win um, the Bundesliga. I don't think that's possible. I think you do need, I think this proved with um, when Kovac was the manager for, for Bayern Munich and they weren't playing one and he was promptly fired. You can't just have good players and win and they just figure it out on the pitch. You need to have good direction and explanation and coaching from the coach or from the manager himself going downwards and then hopefully then the players can then kind of, you know, uh, kind of put all those training things into all those coaching methods and whatever into practice when they're obviously playing the game itself so that's the hope going forward um you never know with united things could end up going completely different than what i would have hoped it would be but you know we hope we really really do hope and then the other bit of news we've got here concerning united there was this the declare or announce the news of a uh, coaching staff being added to Oli's coaching team called Eric Ramsey who's a former Chelsea coach he's joined to do first team coaching um, he'll work one-on-one -on -one with individual players and also take ownership over training on the side set plays. Solskjaer says, as I quote, we've been fortunate enough to convince Eric Ramsey to come and join the best club in the world and in the country. He's a very highly rated coach who is going to be working with individuals and in charge of set plays as well. So it's good to see, don't get me wrong, but similar to the John Murta when Darren Fletcher appointments and being director of football at the club, it just feels like a year too late or a couple of years too late. This is something that a lot of fans who are even critical of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer were crying out for in the beginning of saying hey don't get me wrong if this guy is your dude and you want to kind of go back to the United way you're kind of addicted to this whole nostalgia thing and the legend of Solskjaer and what he meant as a player and you're really pinning your hopes on him being the person that's going to get us back to our rightful place at the top of the league 
then give him all the tools necessary for him to win. You know, give him the best coaches, give him the best players. And it felt as if the coaching staff wise, he was happy with the Mike Feelings and all these other donuts that he had around him. But there wasn't necessarily experienced, like high level coaches that could add to what he does. And what he's obviously said in interviews recently, I remember, he says that he's not a manager or a coach that's doing training, right? He kind of likes to um, kind of uh, give those tasks to his other coaches in his coaching setup, which is fine. A bit concerning, a bit weird, but, you know, he kind of, that's the sort of uh, method that he wants to approach you know being a football manager no problem but then you can't do that with the likes of Mike Phelan right you can't do that with um Kieran McKenna with Michael Carrick right these guys aren't top level coaches in their own right either from what we've seen so far they don't you know they're not people or coaches that you're seeing other teams around the world clamoring to sign up and get involved in their coaching setup so you would imagine with somebody like on Oligon Solskjaer with the lack of experience that coaching at the highest level outside of obviously Mulder that he'd want to get the best coaches in possible to give him the best chance of winning a trophy but he thought he could do on his own he thought he could work it out it didn't obviously work and now the good thing is that he's obviously seen it hasn't worked as you know with the team he has at the moment so he's added to it regardless if this guy is 29 and he happens to be Kieran McKenna's friend from university you know whatever it's a bit of nepotism involved in there I don't care the fact is they've got another coach in who can help out with things that they feel like they're missing out on and hopefully we see a difference. Hopefully we see a change. Hopefully we see it being a positive influence for the players themselves going forward. But like I said, I just feel like it's two or three years too late. Um, this is something that should have been done from the very beginning, from the very onset to improve. It should have been something that could have been added a lot to what we already have. If we finish second with that, that joke team of a coaching staff, just imagine where we would have finished with actual high quality coaches that have been there, done that, adding to whatever magic they've been able to make at Old Trafford at the moment I don't really know but hey good good nonetheless to see we have another coach on the books and hopefully he's going to be a positive influence going forward one can only hope one can only hope in some other news that is a little bit random but something I went to highlight in general just to kind of give the guy props I think I mentioned on another show previously about um listening to the Joey Diaz podcast um um what's it called uh what's it called doesn't matter he's, he's got a new name of it what's it called the ranch to thing what's it called why did i forget the name the joint that's it the joint with joey diaz he's got a new show now obviously he ended the church last year i think sometime during the lockdown if i'm not mistaken right and um the decision to shut it down was somewhat surprising to a lot of fans of joey diaz myself included the shut down the church um it was definitely one of the better ones from out that whole la comedy scene uh crew right comedy source crew whatever one that i definitely did enjoy watching from front to back especially if you're high and stuff right is definitely one of the funniest things to watch um but over, over time everyone noticed that you know lisa and joe and joey were probably the we're probably getting a little bit too toxic for each other over time. They were obviously trying to outcompete each other with the edibles, outcompete each other with the smoking of the weed. And it got to a point where you felt like it was being somewhat destructive, specifically to Lee Sayat's life, because he completely ballooned up through that entire time, right? He went, he went, we got really, really big to, to the point where people were really concerned for his health. But as I've known myself going up and down in weight and, you know, doing my own fitness journey, in general, unless the person wants to make a change for themselves, it's very difficult to get them to change. You kind of have to just wait, the hope that the penny drops and they realize that, hey, the way that I am at the moment now is not good. I need to kind of be there for my family, my friends, and blah, blah, blah. And then they make the decision to do it themselves. So no amount of hate, no amount of trolling, no amount of, you know, concerned emails is ever going to change somebody's um, way they look at themselves, how they approach their fitness until they decide to do it themselves. And, you know, even Lisa, yeah, I think his brother, if I'm not mistaken, is a personal trainer, super ripped and stuff. So he's got people in his family that he can direct help directly help him. Even though I'm not sure if him and his brother are actually on talking terms, but regardless, he will he had all the information, all the people around him that could, you know, help him do so. He didn't want to do so at the time because obviously he wasn't ready. But then as soon as they broke up and they kind of went their separate ways, Joe Diaz and Lisa, Joey went to New Jersey, Lee, I forgot where he went, when he moved back to his parents, I think, but in general, it's been a really positive influence for both. I've seen a complete different change in Joey Diaz specifically. He looks 
looks really good. He's lost a bunch of weight. His skin looks good, even though he's you know he's 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 an older gentleman. He's got a bit of a droopy face. Like he actually looks fresh face in a really weird older way. It's really strange to see. But even in clarity, how he's talking about his family and his kid, like you can tell he's in a good space. And then Lisa, yeah, over time, I've seen some pictures around right, floating of him looking pretty decent. Like he's lost a bunch of weight. And I thought, oh, well done to him. He's obviously looking good. And after listening to the podcast where they sort of reunited, they mentioned about how unhealthy they were prior and you know the changes that they've made but i didn't put it into um you know i didn't really know how much better lee looked until this picture was uploaded that i'm going to be posting here which is um uh a progression of lo of weight loss from lee sayat going from left to right where he's starting weight at what well, yeah this is christmas of last year he was 336 pounds and then now all the way and yeah basically until the other day he's now weighing at 235 pounds so again considering his height he's a pretty small dude i'd imagine somewhere between 5'5 five, five and 5'8 five, i'd assume to be 336 pounds is insane at that weight so for him to lose that amount of weight over time which is essentially what just under a hundred pounds is absolutely wild and really congratulations to him and well done for doing such an amazing thing and getting control of his life again and it's weird isn't it because you'd imagine being in LA and living uh, you know next to Hollywood and trying to make it in a stand-up scene and doing podcasting so if you'd imagine that would be the one place where maybe you are more at your healthiest because you're having to you know you're living in the most like um what's your thing called you're living in the most vain, you know, place in the world, right? Place where people really care about their physical appearance, a place where your physical appearance can dictate what jobs you get or what jobs you don't get. You would imagine that's where the place where you'd be healthiest at. But actually, it's the reverse happened. The moment he left LA, the moment he went back to his parents' home and he started to kind of do normal, quote unquote, things, it's when he suddenly started to get control back of his life. And I think that goes to show sometimes as amazing as some places or some things can be on paper for even for some people it usually most of the time is very much a personal thing it really used a thing about does it mesh with you it doesn't matter about you know what people say or this place is magical this place is where you get opportunities like this is it does is it something that actually meshes with you and what you're about and if it doesn't then sometimes the better thing to do even though it may seem like a failure because i'm a shoot I, i'm sure maybe joe diaz not so because he's more accomplished but i'm sure lisa in the back of his head is probably thinking you know what leaving la and going back to my parents is somewhat of a failure like i didn't actually make it like i'm giving up but actually deciding to leave a place before it actually kicks you out or tells you you're not needed is probably a far better place to be than staying there because i can only imagine how uh how much of an ego blow it would have been to have if Lisa decided to stay in LA, Joe Diaz leaves to go to New Jersey and then Lee realizes how um, little he matters to people without Joe Diaz next to him, right? Because of how, you know, transactional relationships are in LA, right? They don't really care about you. They mostly care about what you can do for them. So that would have been really crushing if he was to do that. So the fact that he took himself away from it with his head kind of, you know, um, held up high, shoulders back and was able to kind of get his life under some level of control. And, you know, he seems like he's in good spirit, especially after listening to the Joe Diaz podcast and stuff. He seems like he's really in a good space. Even his eyes on this fucking picture look incredible right he's less high than he was previously he just looks great it's really really impressive to see Lisa this way man the flying Jew is flying once again for real now and it's just great to see him and I'm really happy for him again like, you know you listen to these guys too often you feel as if like you actually know them and you're proud like you're they're one of your best friends and stuff when you don't know them at all but you know listening to hours and hours of these guys show and seeing what they've kind of been through both of them in their career and everything and you know there was a period where Lee wanted to leave the church and and he didn't he was at a crossroads in his career relationship status was a bit you know up and down you know loads of stuff was going on it's good to see him like sometimes a physical manifestation of where you are mentally it's like when someone has a really messy room it's usually a good indication of where they're at in terms of their overall mental space when you see somebody losing that amount of weight you know you can you're, you're pretty much certain that you know something up here something in their head definitely changed so big up Lisa Lisa yeah. big up the flying Jew he's once again like I said flying for real for real really really happy for him and hope he continues losing the weight and getting to the point where he's at comfortable and able to do the things that he needs to do and happy in it and going on with life in it that's what you want to see man that's what you want to see 
Next on the list. Oh, yeah, let's talk about this. This is pretty cool. This is an article from Bresnan Advisor talking about the return of clubbing events in Berlin. I think they're going to do this for all the major markets. I think they did one for LA, did one for New York, they did one for somewhere in Asia. I forgot where it was, but they're really good, especially considering what's happening in the world and considering the, you know, um, restrictions and whatever put into place in some countries. It's good to see how different clubbing environments across the world are basically dealing with this new reality that we're in and kind of reintroducing everybody back to a dance floor and all that malarkey and of course you know um resident advisor always do really good content concerning berlin itself they have a good way of really kind of capturing the essence of the place despite there being a very um despite most clubs being resistant to press and interviews and whatnot the writers on resident advisor have a good way of basically capturing the the kind of um essence right the ambience of the club and putting it into good words some of the older event reviews from like the early 2000s are still especially in the archives so some of the places that are now defunct are really really good they're, they're the kind of things i used to read back in the day that would legitimately like i went to robert johnson based off of a couple of reviews on ra right i went to um club division i'm um, sorry um what's that thing called um salon the amateurs um as well based on one of these reviews there i wanted to go to tbilisi if there's a review on ra so they do a really good job of kind of um putting you in situ of this place and you know this article i thought did a really good job in terms of detailing the experience of kind of entering back into the club space in Berlin and it sort of threw up some interesting topics and conversation that I want to um, talk about here so the return of events to Berlin written by uh, a lady I'm assuming here called Maya Royston Slater um, Royston spelled the same way as Royston Murphy so maybe they're from the same place I don't know but itself again it's written really really well so big up her regardless um, obviously the first it opens up kind of talking about the Berghain Garden which I've never actually been to I'm pretty sure I think I've been the closest I've been to outside is the stair whale the staircase thing um, that's on like the right and so that's all like clear the thing that you can see on the outside that sort of looks like a clear translucent shell i've kind of been there i think that might be near to where the garden is but i've not actually been in there so i don't actually know what it looks like or how big it is but by all accounts it seems to be a fairly enjoyable space the only one thing that was really interesting that she mentioned about um the Bergheim garden was this section here where it talks about people in the obviously in the in the queue it says the queue itself was a spectacle despite the midday heat most of the hundreds waiting were shrouded in black from classic club wear like itsy bitsy i did their sports sports sport shorts and mesh chops to looks with more performance vigor such as reflective oakley glasses which i'm interested to see people wearing right sort of like it's funny that in the clubbing scene that's a, like a thing but then in the sort of like what's it goiper um uh what's his name um baked alaska sort of world of things right those right wing troll guys in the us they also wear them as like a kind of chad alpha male sort of bro symbol thing but then in europe here they're sort of looked at as a kind of tech inspired 90s early 2000s sort of like club wear attire that you can put on to make sure no one can tell that you're you know rolling on flopping molly or whatever but anyway continue said such a reflective oaky glasses or hocker sky sandals and i was thinking to myself what the fuck are hocker sky sandals look at what hocker sky sandals are right absolutely shocking imagine people going to the burger and wearing these type of things i didn't know this was a thing that people went to wear i thought those dr martin jesus sandals i had before were bad right but these are like pretty much one of some of the worst things i've ever seen so imagine like this is why sometimes reading those articles of people that they write on the internet where they say oh yeah the things that you should wear before you go to a burger here's some outfit inspire inspirations don't bother just wear stuff that you feel comfortable in obviously try and be somewhat kind of understanding uh, of the space that you're going into and kind of make sure that you blend in in some way shape or form but those uh, those articles are bullshit because if people are getting into the burger and wearing these sandals and i'm and i don't get in i'm gonna be pissed i mean i'm gonna throw a hissy fit because because these things are horrendous don't get me wrong it's just a standard hooker with slits on the side um with obviously some exposed bits on the side or sorry panels but they look absolutely horrendous like legitimately some of the worst shoes i've ever seen in my life but anyway let's go back to the review so let's go back to the review so the review itself obviously opens up with the stuff about Bergheim but the one thing that I was interested about was this conversation around wearing masks outdoors right because for the most part from what I've understood in the article um, clubs are open but you're only allowed to obviously to have people um, in your kind of beer open air space place right you're not allowed to be in an enclosed clubbing environment but you're allowed to dance all that sort of stuff is gone out the window but when you're out there you have to still have a mask on 
But the weirdness about it, I think the thing that's a bit strange is that to get in, you need to show that you're negative, right? Whether it's a, um, whether it's a lateral throw test or whether it's a COVID um, vaccine passport to show that you're vaccinated. But you need to show that you're, you know, you're somewhat vaccinated or you're somewhat negative to go in, which is fine, which means that you don't, you don't have the virus. But then when you're outside, which is the place that you would imagine the virus is least um, able to spread, that's everything that we know so far is that the virus usually kind of um, f f kind of uh, spreads a little bit more easy in the kind of enclosed spaces with not good ventilation. So when you're outdoors in the fresh air, you would imagine you don't need to put a mask on. But for some reason, they have this weird thing where you have to put a mask on when you're dancing outdoors but then when you get a drink you can take it off to drink here it's just it's just bizarre it doesn't really make any sense but let's just read the actual thing itself here it said da, 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 oxy garden whereas i think it was somewhere towards the end uh the floor right there yeah so yeah there you go um right now getting into a club in berlin takes preparation at these venues i had to show a negative covid19 antigen test or a vaccine passport or proof of a recent um, virus recovery at the door when ffp2 or medical mask when not seated or register online for contact tracing when we caught up with trauma bar attendee um randon rossbaum couldn't figure out why she got turned away even though the venue was at capacity technically she said her fully vaccinated status means she doesn't count she said it must be because i'm ugly <laughs> she presumed and went to oxy garden where she had a guest list like many people i spoke to over the weekends i was out rossbaum thought it was nonsensical to wear a mask while standing only to be able to take it off just steps away at open airs there's a lot of cognitive dissonance required to take your mask off and put it back on and then take it off depending on where you are and how many people are around you she complained it's a Already the rule in public spaces like Herman Platz or whatever that you don't have to wear a mask. So what exactly? So why do you have to wear one at the open air? And it says, however, yesterday, da, 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 yeah. However, um, okay, let's talk about that. So I don't understand why it's a thing. But I guess in terms of just being ultra safe and the problem is, I guess, with most countries, even in the UK, it's the same thing. It's just a blame game that's really messing things up because what's going to end up happening if we get to a place where everyone's like, OK, all the open airs, don't wear a mask, just do what you want. If there's one place where there's an outbreak of COVID, that would suddenly put pressure, that, that would put pub public pressure on the government to enact some sort of change to combat against that, to show that they're doing something. The clubs end up getting shut down and then no one's got a ability to go and dance again or earn a living doing what they love right that's the problem because it's the blame game they're going to use this opportunity to kind of shut things down if there's one thing especially in the uk maybe but it's different but in the uk there's definitely um it feels like there's definitely uh there's definitely a kind of campaign or mps or you know officials in place at the moment who are their sole aim is to kind of rid us of any kind of fun activities and if we can give them a layup by allowing ourselves to be masterless at an outdoor party and you know spread covid around they're definitely going to take it for sure and then it continues here it says however yesterday Oh, sorry. Yesterday, however, cautionary Instagram stories started circulating within the Berlin Cup community of which of fully vaccinated people who still became infected with the symptomatic cases of the virus. The post urged vaccinated folks to continue getting regularly tested before going out. The one thing that's surprising about this is that I think a lot of people, I don't know why, maybe I'm speaking to a couple people about this, but it's surprising that more people don't know that this is a thing, that there have been plenty of cases, even plenty of instances sorry even at the beginning of the virus spreading of people getting completely vaccinated fully double jabbed up everything um all the i's dotted and t's crossed and still getting covid this is obviously a, a something that's been happening quite regularly but it's amazing to find people who you know very quickly went to go get a vaccine or to make them sure they're able to go and live a somewhat normal life but they don't know everything that's involved you know the risk associated with it the scenarios that could occur they just assumed if you get a vaccine that you're completely immune to getting covid which obviously isn't the case right it doesn't necessarily give you a license to go out there and start licking flipping you know toilet seats and whatnot um but people have this weird i mean again maybe it's just this like it's a lack of information that's being provided at the moment there's this idea that because the vaccine is sort of like a cure which it really isn't if anything the vaccine should be looked at as more as a device to prevent you from spreading as easily if you didn't have it in the first place but it's not a kind of one size fits all kind of fix and everyone kind of responds to it in a different way as well so you would hope people would have a lot more of that kind of information to hand when they were going out so you make sensible decisions right based on your level of comfortability that would basically it it would be nice to have places where they could basically um 
be in charge of whether or not they kind of mandate mask wearing on the dance floor and then you as a customer could then decide which place you want to go to which place makes you feel comfortable but maybe they have to kind of enact these kind of big sweeping decisions so that everyone could kind of be on their best behavior i don't know but i still think it's a bit ridiculous to be outdoors and wearing a mask especially if you're fully vaccinated it makes no sense or you're negative it's just a bit you know, we feel negative fair enough there's cases of people you know being tested double negative and then still having it later on down the day i think the famous one was obviously elon musk when he tested himself and four times i think two out of four he was positive and whatnot it can happen there can be some anomalies here and there but by and large from what we've heard that's why we're allowed to go outdoors if we weren't allowed to go outdoors they would you know if the virus spread outdoors still we won't be allowed to go outdoors i mean we'd be like locked in like the early days in wuhan when they were flipping taping people's doors up and stuff right but that's not the case we know the virus doesn't spread as easily in the open air you would imagine but you know we digress it continues the, 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 the promoters yeah so this is the bit as well that kind of point said i think was very specific to berlin that was very interesting it says here so what does clapping in berlin look like after pandemic promoters like demetria and sorai and dj synthy and the club commission representative lutz um like how do you say that lutz leech light sing light singering lutz light singering light shin ring i think if to say that anyway it continues says all think it's possible that we've headed towards a renaissance they quote berlin as a city has become so sad and kind of lost its touch since the lockdown and curfews dimitri noted uh or sorry dimitra noted going through another winter without having a shared space to connect doesn't seem like an option and i definitely agree with that because i think they're unique in that way over there in berlin because it feels like even though there's people that obviously live there day to day that don't have any connection or or desire to partake in the clubbing scene there it is a fundamental part of the city right it's sort of like the heartbeat of it you don't need to pay attention to it but it is the kind of silent somewhat silent beating drum in the background that kind of slowly but surely keeps that city ticking over and chugging over year in year out people coming to visit and whatnot and without it without that kind of spirit that soul of people rustling around going to different places keeping it somewhat quote unquote alive it does kind of take away from the overall vibe of the place so i can only imagine what it was like and i remember earlier on reading an article from ex berlin about the cases of depression and other sort of you know mental health issues that were going on in berlin during the time of the lockdown it must have been nuts because a lot of people that go there similar to like you know if you're moving to la or you're in parts like that like you're obviously going to those kind of places to pursue a career in the arts a career in entertainment and without that kind of outlet you know as a personality it's definitely going to affect you for the worse so even if it means having to rave with a flipping mask on your face having to rave in a hula hoop having to rave you know um whatever in a cubicle on a table people would much rather be in a shared somewhat environment with strangers talking shit listening to loud music than they would be holed up in their you know apartments um looking out of a window hoping for those days to come back so regardless of the restrictions in place regardless of what is required to go outdoors you know being able to do that in the first place is far better than staying in and i definitely definitely agree with that one then this section it continues says Cynthia is hoping for clubs to strengthen the scene by offering more local residency opportunities you'd hope Lakutia Selector and Uzuri Records founder who I caught up with after playing her first in-person set almost a year at Disobedient Circumstances and Shit Label Party on July 3rd told me that she hopes to see a broader musical programming and a scene rallying together so quote unquote no one gets left behind most notably she urged quote says the diversity that people have been speaking about needs to not only apply to lineups it needs to apply to every facet of life life including what we hear through the speakers that would be nice in it but unfortunately i'm very kind of cynical on that front i don't think that's going to occur i think the people that are going to make the changes that need to be made in terms of representation in terms of kind of you know having diverse lineups and having you know diverse club nights and all that sort of good stuff they're going to do it regardless right they don't need any initiative they don't need to be kind of given permission to do so they're going to do what they think represents their community best or put on the music that they think or put provide a platform that they feel is needed for the space or the area that they basically are occupying at the moment but i think to expect 
wide ranging sweeping changes throughout the entire clubbing space is just a bit naive i think most of these places just operate as a function to generate income i guess or to sustain a lifestyle for some people or to just make sure people are coming through the doors whatever it may be they don't necessarily care about the integrity of the scene they don't care about who represents the club they don't care about if it's representative of the community they just want to put on events that sell out that have people queuing around the block and have people buying loads of drinks at the bar and if that means having to book the same old tired names that play awakenings then that is going to be what's going to that's going to that's going to happen um i don't expect these big institutions to change the only re, the only way i can see it changing that way is if one of the bigger clubs like again like the watergates and the Ber the Berghines, whatever they kind of set the precedent and they decide to say quite loudly when the place reopens that this is our manifesto this is what we want to do going forward we're going to commit to booking this percentage of people da, da, da. i mean they lay out and they kind of make it trendy that's when it's going to be enacted every other place i think without that the most places are going to have to book locally because they're not able to fly people in because they're from countries that are on the amber list or restrictions are put in place so it's going to cost too much money cool but the moment the cost of entry gets lower then we don't we're not required to take tests anymore to go into different regions or whatnot you're going to see the same people from foreign places you know polluting your same lineups and it's going to be the same old shit as before i guarantee you definitely is so i would much more I'd much rather spend my time focusing on the people who are doing the right things, quote unquote, right? Who are trying to make musical programming in the clubbing space a lot more interesting than it has been in the past and supporting those people. And if you haven't seen it and you want to do it yourself, then do it. But expecting these other institutions to take the mantle, it just seems naive to me. It really does seem naive. I don't think that's going to happen. So that's very unlikely going forward. But, you know, stranger things have happened. And if there is a one place where that could happen, it would be Berlin for sure, because they sort of like set the pace and everyone kind of copies them going forward. So it would be quite good if they did do that over there and then everybody around Europe could basically say hell actually you know what maybe it is more interesting if we have a lineup that doesn't contain the same six or seven names in it and just mix it up a little bit because that's basically what our customers want or even if they don't want it this is what we're going to give them and we're going to hope that they like it over time the same way how if we drum over their heads that Masha Plex is one of the best DJs in the world people tend to agree because you just see him on every lineup because that's what tends to end up happening as well for as talented and as amazing some of these guys are because I think there's definitely something about some of these guys who play awakenings and play at exit festival you know the ability to kind of just grind out sets and fly all over the place and you know and somehow be able to be motivated and put on a show and all this sort of stuff is it requires a certain ingredient not everyone can do it but it definitely is an element where i feel as if like sometimes the audiences don't really know what they like or don't like because the only thing you get to hear is this person right they play all the live streams they play their, their charts get promoted on people everywhere they're on all the big podcast mixed streams and stuff they're playing on all the lineups so over time it's very difficult for you to say whether or not you like or dislike that person because they're in front of your face every single place that you look especially on some of these sort of like techno meme pages right they feature the same cycle of people again and again and again and again so how do you know you don't like solomon if you keep seeing him everywhere and he's on everyone's flipping memes and stuff like that it's impossible to kind of discern so sometimes i feel like if they put the same sort of energy they did in those people into some newer people or people that basically you know don't get the attention that they probably deserve there would definitely be a far more interesting dance scene in general it would be a lot more yeah it'd just be a lot more varied a lot more interesting to go to as opposed to seeing the same people playing again and again and again it's like ugh, i don't know maybe it's just me i don't really know but yeah regardless i definitely recommend you check it out it's a really cool article overall um the person did a really good job of kind of um you know summarizing the experience of how it is to kind of queue up um in front of a place you know here this opening line here the soundscape of muff techno clattering flag poles and jovial chatter drifting at this place um plunged me into a state of nervous excitement after july 10th when pandemic restrictions loosened to allow open air dancing uh, events up to a thousand people bergen opened his garden gates marking a big step in return to the berlin dance floors when primary resident bar perimida um started her set at noon the line stretched far beyond the kiosk that love that usually sells late night drinks and brought where so it definitely gives you a feel of what you're going to expect so definitely check it out it's called the return of events um berlin um, written by maya royce and slater it's on ra now it's definitely really informative so definitely give it a view if you've got a minute or two next on the list we've got that we spoke about 
this oh yeah there's plenty of flipping FOMO now that I'm feeling seeing all these flipping videos of people raving it up and going absolutely crazy in different places specifically the possession places possession parties over the weekend um in paris where vtss and stuff and um dj spit and a few other people played um i got a video here where she featured from one of the organizers here posted a video from behind the booth and again before i think um, everything opened up i would could view these things and not really be that concerned and it really didn't bother me too tough but now that you know with the light at the end of the tunnel is finally slowly but surely coming out and we get into a place where we can envision the place where we're going to be back out of doors you know seeing these videos kind of breaks my heart but this party the way they put it together just looks really really impressive they really go out of their way to produce it and add all the extra little gizmos they've got you know projections on the walls and stuff and lights and whatnot they really go out of their way to make it a bit special it's not just a stack of speakers in the corner somewhere and someone playing on a controller like they really go out of their way to produce a really good show so if you're in the city of paris and you're around and you've got some time and you want to sweat your face off definitely check out possession techno they're definitely pulling some good events but this is a video here of it looks like the morning featuring vtss playing some very loud techno music so if you've got your headphones in make sure you pull them out for a minute or two Look at that, that looks really good, isn't it? Real produced lights everywhere, flipping, you know, cordons off stage and barriers and shit like <laughs> And VIPs behind the booth, the DJ, like actually dancing and not just standing there trying to look cute. You know what I mean? Like setting the mood for the whole night. Sometimes I think they have people moshing out in the front there to kind of set the pace and keep everyone's kind of spirits up and whatnot. That's a pretty good look. Next vid. <laughs> got the white decks there. Not look at similar to the Virgil things they designed, but I don't think they are. I think they're just the white editions. So seeing that sort of stuff is definitely getting me back in the mood to go out and, you know, shake my little rump shaker out there in the scene when that happens. So definitely keep an eye out for those parties and places if you're that interested, because I think they're fairly decent. I'm not going to lie. Next on the list, what do we have here? Oh, yeah, this is, yeah, this is um interesting. One. So this is, uh, let's just get this up on the screen, see if it loads. Yeah, cool. So um, I've spoken about Chris Lee a few times on here, obviously, you know, kind of follow a lot of the LA comedic scene, stand up scene, whatever, all those individuals. And obviously he's had a very interesting, you know, 18 months or so, right? He's been accused of some fairly egregious things, you know, being a little bit of a kitty diddler, which for all intents and purposes doesn't seem to be the case but the optics didn't look too great when you're being you know accused by girls that happen to be that are underage of engaging to some very nefarious things especially when you have a you know a wife or a fiance or a girl at home that's pregnant and stuff it just didn't look that great but regardless it seems like he's made some kind of a comeback um he's obviously restarted his podcast um he seems to be doing that quite regularly he has a pop pretty popping patron at the moment people on his discord seem to be enjoying the stuff that he puts out and generally the fans seem to have welcomed him back with open arms um despite him being accused of again something pretty heinous that you would imagine would be a pretty much uh an excommunicator in most places or in most kind of industries if something that you, you get accused of um you know being involved in anything sexual with 
girls that happen to that are underage, or say, what keeps saying happen to be, they are underage, then usually it's a kind of, you know, that's you done career wise. But with stand up and with the fact that most stand ups are kind of, you know, not the most um, clean or PC of people, I think it's given him an opportunity to kind of re enter back into the fold. And I've been wondering for a long time, ever since he started the podcast again, like, why doesn't he just go up on stage? Like, he's clearly, you know, as much as people don't like what he might do on stage, he, there was clearly a point in time where he was really good. I think a lot of people would mention that, you know, maybe it's not their taste, it's not something they would they would pay money to go and see, but in terms of what he does, no one else can do it the way he does, and the fan base that he had at the time, you know, one of the only kind of stand-up comics what people used to mention, that a lot of girls used to turn out to his shows and stuff, especially young ones, which, you know, led to probably the trouble that he got involved in, but we move. So you're just wondering, you know, why don't you just get back on stage and do what comes natural to you what kind of gives you joy what gives you purpose as opposed to kind of trying to substitute it with podcasting which although it could be lucrative i understand and it can be one way of sort of you know um doing material that i would imagine there's nothing that would replace or kind of um substitute going up on stage right and um so far we haven't heard anything especially with the comedy store reopening there's a whole set of new management there um some of the ogs that were there before have obviously moved off the back of joe rogan deciding to go to texas it just seemed odd this would be the perfect time to kind of go and get back on stage and do your thing especially with the things going on in the world you'd imagine people were kind of forgotten about him anyway so he could basically go up on stage with no real problems you would think then i happened to stumble across this um screenshot which is courtesy of an Instagram account, which I'm assuming is like a celebrity gossip Instagram account called Dieu Deux Moi, right? Is that is that meant to be French and something in Spanish? Or is that meant to be is that a French word? Deux Moi, right? Two, two of me, I'm assuming that's what it means. But regardless, someone sent in an anonymous form of submission about him. And this is a really weird um kind of a spot that somebody made of supposedly Chris Lee being at the comedy store. So it says the following. It's a message, a screenshot, obviously, from their Instagram stories. And somebody sent in this anonymous uh, submission that says Chris Lee at the comedy store. And the message reads as following. Last Saturday, I went to the comedy store's main room show. Around halfway through the show, I noticed Chris Lee standing in the hallway looking at the performers super anxiously. Anytime somebody would get near him, he would avoid eye contact. And he only spoke to one other male comic. He was standing there for like 20 minutes. When he left the show at a very uh, a little early, we looked at the car pulling up next to us to leave and he was in the passenger seat literally with his hands up to avoid his face so covering his face so people wouldn't see him seems so sketchy like you're a well-known comedian people are gonna recognize you at the most famous comedy club exactly i heard he might start getting into stand-up again though just a weird situation so from what from what i've known because i think i've only yeah i went to comedy store once and i went to laugh factory a couple of times i went to la in 2015 or 16 it was right and there is a bit i think it's featured in the documentary where next to the kind of i think it's the hallway where all the pictures and the things are or the signatures you can kind of look out onto the stage and i think that's where a lot of sometimes comics stand and stuff and watch their peers and you know can talk whatever and i think that's the place where some comics get annoyed where fans go to if they you know they try to come in and you know um butt in on conversation or whatnot so there is that little kind of arch where you can kind of see where people are performing and what they're doing so it's not you know it's not it's not um out of reason for you see somebody standing there like a famous comic but i guess the avoiding eye contact and stuff makes sense because i would imagine there's a large contingency of people at the store who are probably annoyed that he's back because he's you know one of the top comics in LA in general he kind of seems to attract a crowd people tend to go to shows and he, everyone seems to think he's funny for the most part and there's obviously going to be a contingency of, a contingent of people or contingency a group of people let's remove one who definitely don't want to see him there who think he shouldn't be given another opportunity to go up on stage again so it definitely is going to be a weird place to be especially in LA because everyone's got like um What's the word you call? It? You called it like situational morals, right? Um, or right, situational morals, or kind of temporary morals and ethics based upon the person it is what they can do for their career so a lot of people would generally just want to give him the stink eye give him the cold shoulder generally because they feel like it's the right thing to do and then the moment he gets accepted back in suddenly those people will come slivering back and try and be his friend again i'm sure that's going to happen and in general too there must be a little bit of 
as much as people like to pretend like cancel culture doesn't exist, it doesn't really if you don't want it to exist and you've got the funds to basically weather the storm. But it is still embarrassing to have your inf you have your kind of private life, your sex life kind of be blasted out there to the public. Um, especially something especially when you're someone like a Delia who generally try to portray a completely different image and then the story comes out and it shatters everyone's illusion of what you're actually like, right? And it's kind of not congruent to the to the image that you were basically carefully trying to concoct and present to the public it can definitely be somewhat um it can be somewhat of an intrusive experience to go to to go through you probably don't want people staring at you too tough you want to kind of avoid the the, the glances of strangers because you feel like they're judging you and have something to say when really they're not they're just looking at you because you're a tall lanky white guy wearing weird trainers i don't know jamie you know I mean? i'm sure there's a lot of weird mind games that come into um play there but one of the things that really is strange in this regard is that you would imagine if somebody doesn't feel they, they did anything wrong and from everything that we've heard of Chris Aaliyah, he generally thinks he kind of conducted himself in the best way possible he didn't do anything untoward everything was done consensually and whatnot why would you feel nervous or anxious or guilty about going up I don't really understand it right because you'd imagine the only reason why he was there was because he spoke to the management he spoke to whoever's booking it and they've kind of worked out a kind of roadmap or a way for him to get back on stage and that might include him kind of popping in hanging around seeing people do you know what I mean and then slowly but surely get to a point where he can perform I'm assuming so because I'd assume if they didn't want him to be there he would have been very clear and he wouldn't have set foot on that kind of um, property ever again but to be there in the first place definitely makes me think that there's a route back for him that they've kind of outlined which is interesting too because I've heard supposedly the booker or who's involved in dealing with it is a woman or a couple of women or maybe it's a team not too sure but whoever it is have taken over from Adam Eager who's obviously moved over to Texas so I don't know weird place to be like like I said before when it comes to counterculture and stuff I'm not really a fan of institutions and stuff and communities gatekeeping who can have a career and who can't because I feel like everyone's morality is sort of dependent on the person they're dealing with right one person gets dealt with this way when they do a certain thing and the other person can get dealt with a completely different way based on who likes them who doesn't like them so I'm not really a fan of institutions coming together and saying hey you can't perform here anymore and then collectively everyone agreeing I don't really like that I think fans should be the ones who decide whether you have a career or you don't so if the fans think you know you're, you've done something we can't forgive by you know allegedly dealing with other underage girls um then and they decide not to come to shows anymore or they boycott and stuff then fair enough that's cool but comedy store saying you're not going to perform here ever again you're done in comedy and then other clubs responding i'm not down for it so give him an opportunity let him perform on stage if people want to come and see him tell his jokes and do his weird girly mannerism and have that weird inflection voice the voice thing is strange i think it's i guess it's, it's normal you shouldn't it shouldn't be surprising because it is entertainment it is show business and all that well it is showbiz and whatnot but i never understood why some comics have like a different speaking voice on the podcast than they do when they go on stage tom segura sort of does it he has a really slow cadence on stage as opposed to how he speaks on the podcast which is again somewhat understandable because his delivery is what kind of makes it really funny what he's talking about um but then someone like chris lee has a very infantile weird way of speaking on the stage like he's got that weird like you know, that's so somewhat it's quite like an R worded way of speaking. It just sounds weird compared to actually how he speaks day to day. Um, so I, I never really understood why that's a thing that happens. I guess, you know, everyone's got their way of approaching their material and how they do the show, whatnot. I don't really know anything. I'm just a casual viewer from the outdoors, but um, or from the outside, sorry. But interested to know, like, if you saw Chris Lee's show or if you're a fan of him, would you go? Would you buy a ticket? Would you attend? Um, do you, would you kind of, protest outside of a comedy store and you know let them know that you're not happy that he's performing on stage like what would you do like do you care that much i don't know i, I wonder what the case is here i wonder if it's as big as a deal as a lucy k thing because i remember the lucy k thing when he kept going back and performing at random clubs everywhere people would be protesting they'd be sending emails calling and whatnot threatening to boycott and it kind of you know was a silent protest that followed him everywhere he went to the point where he just stopped announcing or the club stopped announcing that he was popping in he was just like popping as a surprise and if you're there you're there if not if not um but i don't know if chris Aaliyah thing was as big 
it was as high profile as the Louis C.K. thing because Louis C.K. again was maybe more beloved in the terms of a general consumer base and whatnot. You know, HBO, you know, Saturday Night Live, blah, blah, blah. blah. I don't know, many, many specials. Who knows whether or not people have just moved on crystalline and don't really give a shit. I don't really know. But I think if he generally thinks he's not guilty and did nothing wrong, I don't see why he's cowering in a corner in the hallway somewhere, covering his face and avoiding eye contact and shaking. If anything, he should be walking up in there with his head held high saying, you know, I didn't do what I said you think i did and um, you can walk, suck my dick and shit right that's what he should be doing but you know maybe the embarrassment in general of having everyone find out that you're into you know girls that look a particular way girls that might look a particular age is probably more embarrassing than the thing that you did i would imagine so so maybe that's where he's at and he needs to kind of warm himself up but let's see in it let's see what he ends up doing in general but yeah that was the random form submission but yeah let me know what you think in the comments man do you think would you go to a Crystal show now? Do you care about his comedy? Do you ever, did you ever think he was funny? I'd love to know what you think in the comments down below. Next on the list, we have this article courtesy of the New York Post about Spotify staff being outraged that Joe Rogan has a podcast on their platform. I just don't understand, man. These stories come out like every other month, it feels like, and it's just tiring, isn't it? Like, imagine working at Spotify and thinking that you have, and being an employee, right? Not being somebody that's on the board or you've got shares and shit, but just being a general employee and generally thinking that you can dictate to your company who they hire and who they work with. Like, it just what a weird time to be in it what a weird place to be you would imagine in most places or in most cases if your company happened to align itself with somebody that you generally felt like didn't align with your morals or your ethics or your worldview that you as the employee would be in a position where you could just leave and go somewhere else you wouldn't be in a position to like lobby or protest your own company it just seems bizarre doesn't it it doesn't seem like you're operating from a rush position of strength because more often more likely than not they can find somebody else to replace you who just is ambivalent to very in general and just doesn't give a shit um but anyway we continue so as here it says spotify staff reportedly outraged by joe rogan's show so this leg is a text is the following it said joe rogan the notoriously uh polarizing let's get this little thing out of the way because i hate it the totally polarizing host of the joe rogan experience america's most popular podcast 2020 it's upsetting some spotify staff as according to a report employee complaints however fall on the deaf ears of company executives who paid the 53 year old comedian more than 100 million um to secure his stream of the platform allegedly from everything talking about the money thing that's mad that as well because he's that's one talent that people don't really give joe too much credit for because there are some points where he does seem a bit detached from reality and he's not really aware of what goes on in the normal world but for somebody that's as wealthy as him he does come across the most normal i've seen of anybody that's rich as this guy because from what we've heard through the grapevine and through people being chatty patties supposedly the deal is worth way more than 100 million right it's way it's worth a, a lot more and he was just happy with that news being put out there because he doesn't really care about you know looking like the billy big balls in the press so it's far more than 100 million and imagine right and i'd imagine he's got some sort of guaranteed amount that got deposited to his account and whatnot and the amount that the podcast makes in general outside of sponsors and stuff that he makes on the adsense alone with the clips channel like just just insane amounts right that just come through on that uh, into this guy's account and he seems to be fairly normal right he seemed to be fairly cool fairly well balanced and stuff and again I, I kind of go back to this point here at the top here notoriously polarizing I was like can you be polarizing and be the number one f person or number one show in your you know in your field is that possible I don't think it is I don't like I think generally most people think his show is good which is why a lot of people listen to it and which is why he commanded the amount he's able to come out from Spotify I don't think you can be super polarizing and be super popular it doesn't work that way you can be popular in the niche and be polarizing but not generally because people that listen to joe rogan podcasts are far reaching right i listen to it i've been listening to it for years but i'm sure there are people from all walks of life that listen to it for the guest or for the show or whatever or just to unwind so i'm not really anyway we'll continue the quote says here, I'm personally bothered by the transphobic comments and the concerned with the way he might spread misinformation, said one Spotify employee wrote last fall on an internal networking channel on the app Fishbowl inside a report on Tuesday. So one person is right is raising concerns about Joe and they made a whole article about it. Man, you got bless God bless Joe journalism nowadays, isn't it? Um a former employee told the publication that during this time I Spotify the decision to sign a deal with Rogan was the most contentious one the company made. Uh, yep. However, another 
self-employed told an insider that it's the only loud minority of people who are outraged by Rogan. Exactly. Because it doesn't even seem like it's that controversial. If you're Spotify and you're trying to launch your podcasting division platform after the first run of shows with like Joe Budden and um, who's that model? Who's that? Um, who's that plus size model? There was a couple of people that, that launched at the same time. I think it was Hillary Clinton or something. I don't know who, whoever it was, right? That was a first run. And obviously you garnered some level of attention. You got some users, some acquiring of um, listeners were done on that one. But then you want to ramp it up and really go for the juggler, especially with Apple kind of twiddling their thumbs. The best possible person to go get is a Joe Rogan, right? Because Joe Rogan, you'd imagine him to be more of an Apple kind of dude, but you know, they didn't, they didn't kind of wake up and smell the coffee. So Spotify came in, you know, put that, and backed up the Brinch truck and got him signed up. It seemed like a logical signing to do, right? And since then, loads of other shows have kind of followed suit because I'm sure they saw Joe Rogan go and then they thought if they can do business with him, more likely I'll be okay doing business with them too. So I don't really see it as the most, um, what they say here, I don't really see it as a controversial appointment personally. It continues. It says, while only a subgroup of staff may be upset, their numbers were sufficient to merit a town hall meeting in September. But still, what's the what's the number of people that have to complain to get a town hall meeting? Let's not go too far there. To address that, um, they felt Joe Rogan's show was at times anti-transgender, which is mad to say. The Wall Street Journal reported in October, a request by some staffers for the Joe Rogan experience to receive an editorial supervisor was denied by the company. And Rogan subsequently retweeted a video mocking the employees for being over sensitive which is true imagine trying to get in somebody to oversee editorial supervision of the show it's just nuts the reason why it works is because you get the illusion or you get the idea that somehow the only people kind of booking the show is rogan and whoever else does the booking and J young jamie right there's not like a hundred million staff attached to the show that's what kind of makes it such a good thing to listen to because it's generally a conversation between one guy who's really curious about whoever the guest wants to talk about and another person who wants to talk about something or promote a product they're selling or a book or whatnot so you get some really interesting far-ranging conversation especially when it's kind of open format three-hour conversation sitting down no distractions and stuff like it's that's what makes it special having somebody overseeing it in an editorial sense it's just going to shit it up and the one thing that you know is a perfect recipe for messing up something that's good is getting more people to add on to it like that's the quintessential way a writer's room whenever you start adding more writers more producers more handlers immediately the thing that you're trying to do goes to complete shit the less people the better more focused it continues he is the biggest voice by far that's going um to accelerate our business and employee what your business says um what's in general said to them getting him a spotify and soon exclusively is going to help to bring a lot more audience onto the platform and hopefully we can spread that to other programming yeah imagine because as much money as they gave Joe Rogan, I'd imagine I would like to know how much is an acquisition prior to Joe Rogan joining, right? So maybe they're, they've actually, the ones that have actually made the killer deal because they've basically been able to acquire users at a far less cost than they did prior because they've got Rogan on the platform, right? A lot of people probably signed up to Spotify or simply to listen to the show. But the funny thing is with Spotify, because they're, you know, a pretty shitty company, you pay your flipping Spotify monthly fee and you still get ads that play on the flipping stream when you listen to JRE. It's not that annoying because they're only like 30 seconds and you don't have to wait too long to, for them to pass on by. But you'd imagine paying for Spotify premium that part of the premium experience would be that you don't have to listen to ads but you know whatever it continues to say in the case of rogan a total of 10 meetings have been held with various groups of individuals to hear their respective concerns spotify ceo daniel x said in september meeting vice report at the time and some of them want rogan removed because of the things he has said in the past it ends here in addition to the company staff of rogan infuriated fellow spotify podcast stars including prince harry and Meghan muggle after telling 21 year old not to get covid 19 vaccine a claim of which he subsequently backpedaled which i wasn't a fan of but again i understand 100 million million plus in your account and the future of your family depending on it or the, the legacy and the kind of future of your generations to come i definitely understand making those adjustments but if i did not immediately return the post request to comment so the point to point out here is that funny enough signing the spotify deal as lucrative as it was for joe rogan's bank account has turned into a weird sort of attack vector in it something that musk spoke about something that joe spoke about a few other subsequent times where elon musk was speaking about the fact that he decided to kind of sell all his homes and give away all his worldly possessions so that he could focus on obviously the projects and the companies that he's obviously running but also to limit the amount of attack vectors he gives to the press and to the media because i'd imagine somebody like him who's operating at such a high level you probably need as less 
um, opposition or attacks coming your way, even though he spends too much time on Twitter and social media and he seems like a bit of a fame whore, he still doesn't need to have people out there constantly writing hit pieces out about him, trying to tear him down because he decided to go on a boat or because he bought a new Rolls Royce or because he's got this weird mansion in the middle of a forest. He doesn't need that extra hassle. So he decided to strip himself of all those other possessions, focus on his family and obviously on his businesses and, you know, um, Dogecoin and whatnot. And it limits the amount of tax, but still he's probably one of the most high profile billionaires obviously in the world. And he's probably somebody that a lot of people generally don't have a lot of time for. So it didn't really help too far, but you can only imagine what it would have been like if he would have been like a standard billionaire that gets helicopters and private jets everywhere and is you know going to flipping ibiza it would have been insane so jerry Rogan signing this spotify deal as kind of low-key and as cool as he is and generally like i said for somebody as wealthy as he is he seems to be the most normal of people that i've kind of noticed with money that he doesn't necessarily even talk about it too much but since he signed that deal it has turned into a sort of weird poison chalice poison bank account whatever it may be because they don't stop with the attacks like it's like every other month somebody's coming out saying something about him trying to tear him down trying to get the show to cancel or whatnot and it just seems to me like a waste of time because what do these people think is going to happen spotify have invested a hundred million dollars plus again like i said people with their ear to the ground that know the business behind the scenes have said it's far more than a hundred million Joe's just happy with that number being put out there because he's not, you know, he doesn't care. Um, if that's the case, why would they drop him at the drop of a hat because some of their employees are upset about the people he has on his show? It doesn't make any sense. It really, really doesn't. They could easily just throttle the show behind the scenes and make it not appear on the algorithms or whatnot. They can do loads of things to prevent it being pushed out. But in terms of getting him off their platform, that's not going to happen. Um, and also I'd imagine contractually there are things put in place on both sides to make sure that they're protecting themselves. So if he ever was to get fired, quote unquote, from Spotify, they'd have to pay him um, an exorbitant amount, right, to get him out. And I'm sure he wouldn't go quietly either. It'd be a lot of bad, unnecessary press for them. So, they, you know, you can easily weather the storm of a couple of employees being annoyed that he had some author on that's talking about maybe transgender, um, you know, giving, giving kids, you know, pills and stuff when they're really young isn't maybe a good thing. You, you can maybe weather that storm better than you can weather f firing um, Joe Rogan because of a couple people in your employee staff are upset about the show in general. It just seems a bit strange. But again, like I said, you accept the money and you kind of maintain some editorial control, not all of it, because all those shows that Joe kind of lied, basically, I'm a big fan of him, but he did lie. He did say, oh, we're, we're, we're kind of porting the shows over and, you know, they're going to take time to load and they never came back, right? All the shows, of, I think, with Gavin McGuinness, Milo Yiannopoulos, a couple of Crystal Lear ones, Brian Callum was did the, not, obviously not there in the library. And then he admitted later on in passing that he was happy for them to take them off because he didn't care. But... Apart from that, for the most part, nothing's really changed on the show too tough. There's been a few weird kind of like advertisements that he hasn't necessarily talked about, like the McDonald's thing and some other stuff that he just speaks about too enthusiastically. That doesn't really make any sense. I think one day he was talking about the Lincoln Jeep or something that weird sounded like an ad, but you know, whatever, let him get his money. But in terms of everything else, everything's been fairly, you know, the same so much, so far, so good. But I think one of the costs of signing such a deal and taking the money from such a big company is the fact that you're going to always be the kind of target of some people um, when it comes to cancellations or whatnot. And again, I think he's uncancelable in general because I think the whole point of being uncancelable is sort of mass wealth, which basically allows you not to be run by these organizations that you're signed to. And if you decide to let you go, then you can continue going and doing your show as per normal. But um, yeah, I think these Spotify staff are wasting their time. They should probably focus on just, you know, maybe move into a company that they feel better aligned with their politics or their morals or their ethics. It doesn't make any sense, you know, picketing your own company you work at because a show on there that you don't like. It's just so bizarre. It really, really is the strangest thing. I never really understood that. Like maybe people are to attach their jobs and feel like they can't get another good one. But if you generally think the company you're working at is going against everything you stand for, just leave. Like, honestly, just leave. Trying to get Joe Rogan sacked, it seems like the most, the biggest waste of time I've ever seen in the history of waste of times. But, you know, again, what do I know? 
next on i think that might be what, what time we got now we think we think we've wasted enough time here haven't we yeah now we're 20 let's let's leave it there so now we're 20 hope you guys are seeing the show episode number 476 thanks also for tuning in as per usual been a pleasure to have your time if it's your first time check out the show via youtube you know what to do smash the like button subscribe leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast like, please share the show and leave me a five star review that would be more than helpful and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace